so how did you really decide to get into May Mobility as opposed to siding with, I don't know, Waymo, Pony AI, or anything like that? Like why go off on your own, guy? I guess is the question. Yeah, well, you know, I think uh, by the time I was starting May, I had been part of three really great autonomous uh, vehicle teams. So at MIT, at Ford, and at Toyota. And, uh, you know, the way that we build systems, you know, we were seeing a lot of the same problems over and over and over again. So, you know, like, how do you handle edge cases? What do you do when, when a vehicle encounters a situation it's never been in before? Mm -hmm. And the, the prevailing approach seemed to be to throw more engineers at it. And you ended up with these massive engineering teams, thousand plus people, essentially trying to catalog all of the scenarios to, to render all the edge cases into known cases. And this just wasn't working. And, and I think it still arguably doesn't work. Fair. Uh, so I think, you know, one, one way of kind of framing it is that I feel like I've had the luxury of failing enough times <laughs> to get desperate to try something different. And uh, so main mobility really was sort of a contrarian's approach to autonomy. You know, what, what is a radically different way to think about driving that might have a chance of, of scaling, you know, so that you can go from city to city and from environment to environment where you fundamentally change the idea of what an edge case is and you try to make these, not edge cases, but just stuff that happens, uh, stuff that the vehicle can reason through. And so that's, it was that desire to just really kind of shake things up and do things differently that led to May. Okay. Um, what cities does May Mobility offer rides in so far? Yeah, we've been in 12 cities since the founding of the company. Some of those uh, have wound down as you know natural you know projects come and go, um, but uh, today we are live in Arlington, Texas, our, Ann Arbor, Michigan, our our base town headquarters. I have town. questions on that later. <laughs> Great, uh, Grand Rapids, Minnesota, which is a tiny Iron Range city of about fourteen thousand people in very northern Minnesota, um, which uh, which we can talk more about there because that's a really interesting use case. A lot of people get fixated on robo taxis. And that's probably the number one thing we should we should talk about. Like, oh, yeah. Name Mobility is not a robo taxi company. We do something very different. Um, and uh, I'm missing one, uh, which is not a good thing. Uh, there's a fourth one in there somewhere. It'll come to me. Oh, Sun City, Arizona. Okay. And then previously, we've operated in eight other cities, uh, including cities in Japan as well. That's quite the spread there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. So you mentioned edge cases, and there are two cities that came to mind. Um, one in Minnesota, I can imagine, is an absolute nightmare with the weather fluctuations and ice. Um, there seems to be this weird mentality of, oh, an autonomous vehicle can operate under any conditions. Like, well, you can't really break the laws of physics when driving on ice. So how do you really handle some of the really nasty weather conditions in Minnesota? Yeah, you know, I think there's there's two sides to weather. There's the uh, impact on perception mm -hmm. uh, resulting from just, hey, there's stuff on your windshield, stuff on your cameras. And, uh, you know, we've, we've kind of taken, I think, a harder path by choosing to operate in places where we have to deal with snow. It's not always sunny. It's in the rains. Uh, and so we have been kind of forcing ourselves to deal with bad visibility, bad sensing conditions. Now, that's not to say it's an easy problem. That we've now nailed it. But I think we've done a pretty good job at being able to operate. Uh, kind of the, the the almost quick, easy way of figuring out whether our vehicle can handle weather is that you know, if your windshield wipers are doing this, we're fine. <laughs> we're not. <laughs> and of course, time will time will improve uh, the the operating design domain, and we'll be able to handle more and more. Uh, you talked about slippery uh, slippery conditions, mm -hmm. icy. Uh, so one of the main ways that we handle this is by controlling our speeds. So we target environments right now that are are basically where buses go. So our target market are basically, you know, look at most of most of the United States. Most of the United States uses buses for public transit, and most of those buses are operating at speeds 30 miles per hour below. And at 30 miles per hour and below, you, you have a lot more physics <laughs> working in your favor. You know, a lot lower kinetic energy, your brakes are a lot more effective. Uh, and then if things do get slippery, you can slow down by a little bit and still be in, in a pretty safe regime. Okay. Um, the other one I want to circle back to was Ann Arbor. Um, that's got to be a very stark contrast between Japanese pedestrians versus Ann Arbor pedestrians. 
<laughs> uh, absolutely. So uh, yeah, we've been been having a a lot of people through for for uh, demo rides lately, and uh, you know the students are moving in. Uh, we're moving into campus, and uh, uh, you know, go blue, but damn the pedestrians do not behave themselves. <laughs> They're just all over. The <laughs> uh, you know, some a lot of uh, AV companies talk about Market Street in California. Market Street's got nothing on. On uh, Main Street and State Street here Ooh, in Ann Arbor, no. when <laughs> Main uh, State, no, <laughs> yeah, and, you know, there's on-street parking, which is one of the hardest things for AVs because uh, on-street parking blocks your view of what's going going on. Pedestrians can come out any time; those cars can start moving out, and of course, they're constricting the roadway. And in Ann Arbor, you've got very narrow roads. Of course, with the on-street parking, you've got pedestrians ill-behaved. You name it; it's just challenge after challenge after challenge, and it's really. Uh, you know, where, where you get not just one crazy thing happening at a time, you'll end up with four or five crazy things happening at the same intersection at the same time. And this is where like a traditional sort of edge case kind of approach just would fall apart. You, you just can't do it. But you're right. The contrast between this where, you know, in the United States, when when you're at a uh, traffic light, the traffic light turns green, it doesn't quite mean go. It means begin being more aggressive and assertive with respect to all the negotiating for space with pedestrians, right? So, and then it's always like, I'm going to go, you're going to go, and you're kind of jockeying for position. It's a live negotiation. That could not be more different in Japan. In Japan, pedestrians are highly compliant. They basically don't jaywalk. But conversely, when it is, uh, when they do have the right of way, they just go, heads buried in their phones. They don't pay any attention. They completely trust that the cars are going to stop for them. And so one of the, you can imagine if you built an autonomy stack where you have considered thousands of intersection edge cases and how the vehicle should, should behave, and it works great. Let's suppose you've nailed it in Market Street. And now you go to Tokyo. Uh, or, um, or, <laughs> no. it, it's not going to work at all. Right. <laughs> uh, so, um, and Tokyo is hard, uh, to be fair. To Tokyo is really hard. But we did operate in Takashiba, which is a district in Tokyo. Uh, slightly more structured and benign, uh, but still where we have a lot of these complexities. But what we had to change in our system is really cool. We didn't have to change a thousand different rules scattered through our system of how intersections should work and how we should ne negotiate with pedestrians and, and how queuing behavior should work. Uh, our system is based on the simulation capability that we have in our car. And the way that our car makes decisions is by simulating what pedestrians are going to do. So we went in and did brain surgery on our models of pedestrians and made them a lot more compliant, a lot more likely to, to yield when the light is red and a lot more likely to go when the, the light is green. And now the behavior that we want out of our car falls out automatically from that, that change in the underlying model. So this is the, the advantage of when you, you have that simulation capability that's on the car and you use that to, to inform and adapt your decision making rather than trying to write down everything ahead of time. And probably I, I, I should describe what multi-policy decision-making is. Yeah, so next question, so go ahead. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so uh, if you're familiar with the uh, reinforcement learning in general, uh, so you know the, the basic idea in, in reinforcement learning is that sometimes it's easier for some problem domains to write down what good looks like rather than to write down how to solve a problem. So if you're playing a game of chess, for example, it's a, you might write a reward function that says, hey, it's really good to capture a, a queen, uh, you know, really bad to lose your pieces as well. And you can assign points to these things. And then from there, you can apply machine learning methods to compute the best policy. OK, given that you don't want to lose your queen, how should I move in order to avoid losing my queen and to capture their queen? Now, traditionally, uh, a reinforcement learning is, is too hard to apply to autonomous driving because uh, the, the space is hugely dimensional. There are just a huge number of things that can happen at the same time. It's a continuous domain, of, a continuous value domain. So it's not grids of pieces moving discreetly from one cell to another. It's an infinite range of velocities and speeds. And yes, if the pedestrian changes their speed by half a meter per second, it matters. <laughs> so you don't get that discretization effect. So the search space becomes very large and the space of actions that you can execute is very large. And this has, has basically put reinforcement learning, as cool as it, as it is, has made it impractical for autonomous driving. What we did is we 
we found a way to basically get good approximate reinforcement learning solutions in the autonomous driving domain. So the idea is pretty simple. You can imagine that you've got a space of all of the policies that the autonomous car might have. You know, maybe in the lower right corner, you've got aggressive driving and over here you've got conservative driving and over here you've got one that likes to change lanes a lot. So this it's this uh, abstract space in which the behavior of a vehicle might exist. So what you'd ordinarily want to do is do a search over that entire space to find the policy that works best over the entire range of all conditions that a vehicle might, might encounter itself in. That's too hard. But suppose you say, what about the situation I'm in right now? Can I find the policy that works the best in the situation that I'm in at this moment? No, still too hard. <laughs> but now what if you said, all right, what if I give you a couple dozen points in this space, 16 different policies, and now I, I ask you, which of these 16 policies is the best for this particular situation that I'm in? This you can do. Right? This you can build a simulator and try each of those 16 policies in a closed loop simulator live on the vehicle to game them out and let those policies compete for control of the vehicle. And then we can actually do some fine tuning on those policies. So basically the key thing is that we don't tell the vehicle what to do. We give the vehicle this diverse sampling of different driving styles and let it do an election to figure out which of those driving styles is best suited to the conditions that the vehicle is currently in. So think about that this is kind of kind of cool because sometimes good driving is careful driving, right? Sometimes good driving is aggressive driving. Sometimes the right thing to do if you are going uh, approaching a traffic light and and the traffic light turns yellow is is to step on the gas and get th get through there because what if there's a car uh, tailgating you right behind? You know, there, you know, applying aggressive braking is not a good decision. So it turns out to be really hard to prescribe in advance what the vehicle should do in every, every situation. But you give the vehicle a palette of options and let it try, try these out in simulation on the car, then it can make and adapt decisions to the situation it's in. Now, the hard part about this is that now you have to have this simulation capable, capability that lives on the car and it has to be stupid fast. So literally every 200 milliseconds, we're running thousands of these simulations across each of the each, each of the policies in our policy space, uh, marginalizing over all of the uncertainty of, is that pedestrian going to step off the curb? Is that traffic light going to turn yellow? Is that car going to run the red light? We sample over all of these things, these externalities, and build up a risk profile for every one of those 16 policies in our space. And then for the next 200 milliseconds, the winner gets to control the vehicle. <laughs> and then we wash, rinse, repeat, do the same thing again 200 milliseconds later. And so to give you an idea of the, the sort of throughput that we've got here, uh, every second of clock wall clock time, we simulate about two hours of driving. Wow. So it's a really stupid fast simulator, but what it does is it allows our vehicle to, to adapt and, and even say like problem solve in situations uh, that, that our engineers hadn't thought of. That is definitely interesting. I've only heard of one other company who does any sort of predictive modeling like that, but I think you guys have taken it a bit further. It, I, I, it, it is a really strange way to approach the problem. And, you know, in, in a way, I, I take uh, some blame for the way, that, <laughs> you know, for years I taught robotics and how to do robot planning. And I, I taught the conventional, you know, sense plan act mm -hmm. cycle where, you know, you've got this corpus, this decision-making logic. And when the vehicle does something wrong, you go and you do brain surgery on it. And it's just so deeply ingrained that this is how you build a, a system. Um, but it doesn't, it doesn't scale to these complex real world situations. Uh, so again, you know, I, I, I have the advantage of having failed three times before. <laughs> it's all right. That's how you learn. Um, so do you license this technology or is this strictly just used on the main mobility fleets? Uh, our focus is on building and deploying the technology. So we, we build the technology, uh, but we don't license it to, to other, other folks. Okay. I think there's a business opportunity there perhaps, but <laughs> we'll see. There could be. Um, but, you know, I think one of the things that we're excited about is, is that by actually bringing our service into the world, 
we have the greatest confidence is kind of a switch to business. Um, let me let me back up. One sure. of the biggest questions you've got when you're trying to build a business around autonomous vehicles is who's going to make the money. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that I worry about for uh, AV companies that focus on a widget or a licensing model is that they're going to get a huge amount of downwards price pressure and they, they're going to sell a small, small little widget that goes into every, every Cadillac uh, and they'll, they'll make you know, 3% margin on it, which would be fine in the, in the, uh, in the tier one space. Right. That's not a great business though. And in my, my belief is that if we're solving some of the world's hardest problems, maybe we should go and capture a larger portion of the revenue pie. And for us, that means building the technology, yes, uh, but then also bringing it into the world where we can, we can go and solve some of the world's hardest transportation problems. 